Uh, so as Ricardo said, uh, I'm Margot Atwell. I'm the director of publishing at Kickstarter, uh, and I've been here for four years. Before that, I worked at an independent publisher for seven years. Um, in addition to working at Kickstarter, I am a prolific backer. Uh, I've backed over 300 projects. I have also created two projects. I funded my second book on Kickstarter uh, a few years back. Um, it was a book called Derby Life, a crash course in the incredible sport of roller derby. Uh, and I raised about $9,000 from 254 backers. So I want to go over a few stats, um, give you a sense of uh, the scale of Kickstarter. Since we launched in 2009, over $125 million has been pledged to publishing projects with over 11,000 projects funded. Uh, and then I'm calling illustrated books, anything that's an illustrated book, a children's book, a photo book, et cetera. Um, so over $38 million has been raised for illustrated books and that represents 3,400 projects. I'm going to share a few samples now. So um, Augie and the Green Knight is uh, a children's book created by Zach Wiener Smith of Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial. It's a, an online comic. He wanted to tell a story about uh, a young adventurous girl um, who is uh, scientifically precocious uh, taking a fantasy adventure. So he came to Kickstarter to raise money for it. And he raised almost $400,000 from 9,000 backers. Uh, Here's an illustration and uh, the cover of the book. Um, so now I'm going to share a book that's a little bit more uh, typical for what we see in the category. Um, Jerry Zhang, uh, Zhang was, uh, is the father, um, he's an Asian American man and father of a young girl. And he was devastated when his three-year-old daughter told him that she didn't want to be Chinese um, because her favorite children's book character was uh, a little redheaded white girl. So Jerry looked around to see if he could find uh, books that were, you know, centering Chinese characters, and he really couldn't find any good ones. So he wanted to create this to create a role model and um, an exciting character for his daughter. When he brought it to Kickstarter, he raised over thirty thousand uh, dollars from more than seven hundred backers. So now he's out there making this book, and over seven hundred people will have access to it for their kids, their libraries, and their communities. So this is what a Kickstarter page looks like. The essence of Kickstarter is it's a place to raise money for something, but it's also a great place to build community and get people invested in your book idea, just as Jerry did. Um, I'm gonna go through the different aspects of a project and how you tell your story on the site. Uh, next slide. So one of the main elements of a project page is the project image. It's essentially the book cover of your project. It's what people see when they're, slimming, they're skimming through the site. It's what shows up on social media. Uh, and it, it really gives people a sense of what you're doing, you know, what they can expect, especially from an illustrated book, a children's book, a photo book, or a magazine. The aesthetics are really important. So this is your, uh, your first and most powerful tool to show people what they're going to see in the book itself. Um, a good project image is um, you know, colorful, uh, it scales down pretty well. Um, typically, we like to see images without a lot of text overlay on them. Um, and there's some sort of like strong element or uh, something that's strongly visually interesting. Um, so your Kickstarter page is a place where you can tell your story. Um, in addition to the project image, you have the project video. It's not required to have a project video, but we see that when you have a video, it, uh, projects with a video are about 50% likely to reach their goal. Uh, projects without are only about 30%. So we really like to see people using videos because it's just another tool in your toolbox for telling your story. Right. A good project video is short. Um, it tells your story in a compelling way and uh, you want to make sure that you've got good lighting and good sound. So you don't want any weird echoes or uh, muffled sound or, you know, don't take it in a dark room. Another element of your project is uh, the story section. So you can tell the story of your project in text. Um, you want to explain what you're doing, why you're excited and why backers should be excited. 
Uh, and also you can use this space to talk about how much work you've done already, um, the timeline for your project, when people should expect to receive rewards, et cetera. Um, the more you can make a compelling case for why it's great what you're doing and why you're the person to do it, uh, the more excited backers are likely to be. Um, then you can also use visual elements such as additional images, GIFs, supporting videos, and nice design to make the project page attractive. Because again, this is essentially sort of the resume for your project. You're showing people how you produce something, and especially with a visual book or children's book, they're going to be looking at how well the page is produced to determine how well you're likely to make the book. Go ahead. So one way you get people to sign on and back your project is by offering them rewards. Rewards can be anything. Um, the majority of people want a copy of the book itself or an ebook or at a higher level, maybe a signed copy. Um, but we really encourage people to have a variety of rewards. So at least five to seven different rewards at different levels um, so that anyone with any price range can back your project and uh, become part of it. So um, we see that the most common pledge level on the site is $25. And the tier that tends to raise the most money uh, across the site on average is $100. Um, in addition to offering the book itself, you can off also offer uh, unique objects, um, experiences, et cetera. So for example, if you're a photographer, you could offer a, a signed limited edition print. Or if you're a, um, an illustrator, you could offer the original art at a very high tier. Um, there are a lot of different rewards people offer that, uh, that people get very excited about. Um, so before I go into goal, I wanna explain a little bit about the mechanics of Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is an all or nothing funding platform, which means you set your goal, which is a, a financial goal. Maybe, um, for example, my project, I set a goal of $7,000, which is what it was going to take to make that book. Um, so you set your goal and then you set an amount of time between one and 60 days. Once your project goes live, you have that amount of time to raise at least your goal amount. If you succeed, then you get the money, you get to go make your project, and then you get to send the rewards to all of your backers. If you do not reach or exceed the goal amount in that time period, it's okay. Nobody's card is charged. You don't have to deliver any rewards. Um, and you can actually come back and try again uh, with what you've learned from the first project. So it's not a tragedy if your project doesn't fund the first time. Um, it often means you just haven't done enough prep work in terms of building your community in advance. Uh, and we've definitely seen that people who run a project, it doesn't succeed, and then they do some more work and come back. Um, they often have really excellent second campaigns that reach or even exceed their goals. So uh, how do you set that goal? Um, one, you wanna plan your budget carefully. You wanna make sure that all of the costs for making the project are covered because the worst thing would be to reach a goal, have the money, get to go out and make your project, and then discover that you're like 30% short of what you actually need to make the project happen. Um, so you should think of all the costs to make a book, and I'm sure that um, the next couple presentations are going to give you more information about how to go about that process. Uh, you also want to factor into your budget um, money for producing the rewards and shipping them. Uh, and we would encourage you to actually get something that's the size and shape an approximate weight of your book, literally go to the post office and cost it out because a lot of people underestimate how much shipping is going to cost and that's a real bummer at the end of the project. Which brings me to the third point, um, you should plan for cost overruns. So you, know, you don't want to inflate your budget by 50%, but factor in a little bit of money in case shipping goes up or um, the copy editor costs a little bit more than you budgeted for. Um, you also wanna factor Kickstarter fees into your project. For successful projects, Kickstarter takes 5% of the money raised, and then there's about a 3.5% payment processing fee. So I usually budget 10% for fees uh, when I run on a project. Um, there is no cost to run a project, and if you do not hit your goal, no one's charged any money. Kickstarter doesn't make money, you don't make money, and the backers don't have to pay anything. Um, and then I also encourage people when they're thinking about setting their goal, once you know how much it's going to cost to do the thing, you do want to be kind of conservative because we're an all or nothing platform. 
You can always raise more money than your goal, but you can't raise less. So those are a few pieces of the puzzle for how to plan your goal. Go ahead. Uh, I want to talk also about what you need to prepare before you launch. You should have a good plan for how to make your book. And again, the next two presentations should set you up for success on that front. Uh, you should have your well thought out budget and you should have an outreach plan for what to do uh, in order to get people's attention and get them excited about your project. So it's really important to build up a community before you launch a project. So if you're a writer, um, you should be sharing, you know, publishing in magazines or blogs or things like that, um, or on your own blog or website or medium. If you're a photographer, you should be sharing via Instagram or Twitter or whatever other channel works best for you. But it's really important to share your work with people um, and get people excited about what you're doing even before you press the launch button for Kickstarter. Um, it's also really important to plan your launch strategy in advance so that you're not left scrambling once your project's live and your clock is ticking. So a few great ways to spread the word about your project. Um, email is a really, ex uh, really successful way to get the message out there. Um, you can use personal emails and send individual emails to your strongest supporters and friends and fans. Um, you can also use a mailing list. Um, you can also uh, use other formats like um, social media, such as uh, we see that Facebook and Twitter tend to work really well. But if you've got a strong connection with your Instagram followers or your YouTube followers, that can work as well. Um, you also want to plan publicity. So you can reach out to blogs and websites that are related to uh, the subject of your book um, and send them just you know, a brief email, maybe a paragraph about who you are, what you're doing, and why their viewers might care about that. Um, you can also send them a preview link of your project. So once you start building your project and have something you're happy with, you can send a preview link to press or to a colleague or a friend and ask them to give you feedback on it. Um, it acts as sort of like a mini press kit with everything in one place. Um, and then you can also talk to influential people and organizations. So if you're a member of the Sci-Fi and Fantasy Writers of America, you can see if they're willing to support your project or s help spread the word. Um, if you have a friend who's got a big mailing list that's related to the subject of your book, you can ask them if they're willing to send something out. Um, now is a really great time to get creative and think about different ways to spread the word about what you're doing. Um, there's also a very vibrant community on Kickstarter itself. So that's one piece of the puzzle, but not the majority of the puzzle. Uh, people often ask me what makes book projects successful on Kickstarter. Um, the first thing is you need to have a good idea and be willing and able to express it clearly. Um, having a great idea and conveying your passion for it is going to go a long way to getting people excited about it. Um, second, for an illustrated book, you really need to have great art. You don't need to have the whole book's art nailed down yet, but you do need to have at least a few sample images and an aesthetically pleasing project page. Um, and then third, you need an excited community uh, because if you don't have that community con to connect to and you can't connect to them through the course of the project, it's going to be really challenging to see that through. So this has been just a really lightning fast overview. Um, but you can go to kickstarter.com and check out our creator handbook for more information. Um, and once you have done your research and gotten all the, the ducks in a row, um, you can go ahead and start building your project draft on the site. Um, so uh, I'll be around for questions after this, but now I am going to turn this over to Ricardo. So thank you, Margo. Uh, and I have to say, I think Kickstarter is really an amazing platform because um, through crowdfunding, you're not just getting money, getting funding for your project. You're also getting um, early backers and people who are going to be super passionate about your project because they'll feel like they've helped you create it. So when time comes to publish the book and market the book, these people are going to be invaluable. They're going to be your street team. So you're getting funding and you're getting like early supporters and that's just invaluable. There's nothing like it. So for your project, you've done a successful Kickstarter campaign. We're going to see how you're going to spend them and how you're going to put together 
a book that you're proud of and that your supporters will be proud of as well. So let's embark on your publishing journey. As you can see, there are quite a few steps in the publishing journey. And this is whether you're publishing through a traditional publishing company or self-publishing. Process is, is unchanged and it's probably looked the same um, for any kind of book you're going to publish. There might be variations here and there, but generally it consists in uh, a few steps. The first one focuses on the writing. And that's what editing is all about. It's making sure that your text is as good as it can be. And that's done through a first round of developmental editing, then copy editing. Then once you have your text ready, it's time to join uh, with the illustrations or the pictures and put together the, a beautiful book and making sure that it looks as good as on in, in the inside. So that's what typesetting and formatting is all about. And on the outside, your cover design. And then you distribute. But before you distribute, you make sure that there aren't any errors left in these final files. So that's what proofreading is for. And finally, distribution. And as you can see, marketing doesn't come after distribution. You don't st start to think about how you're going to market your book once it's published. You start to think about how you're going to market your book before you start writing it. I mean, that's where Kickstarter is also powerful in the concept of crowdfunding. You're thinking about how you're going to find people interested in your book even before you put it together. So as you can see, there are quite a few steps in there. And if you really want to publish a professional product that your backers are going to be proud of, you can try to do it on your own. Uh, but to save you a lot of time on the learning curve and so you don't have to learn all the skills that are involved in publishing a book, I highly recommend you work with professionals. And that's where Ritzy comes in. If you don't know anything about Ritzy, in short, we're a community of really top publishing professionals. So that's editors, copy editors, proofreaders, designers, interior layout designers, marketers, publicists, and ghostwriters. So for any step of the publishing process that I've just been through, you can find someone to help you with it on Reedsy. So let's go more in depth on the first step, editing. Important thing to know about editing is that there are several steps to it. And a lot of people, when I say editing, they think about, oh, yeah, they're going to correct my grammar errors and make sure that I haven't forgot a, a comma here and there. That's not all that editing is about. There are several stages. And the first one actually focuses on the structure of your book. That's content editing or developmental editing. And for, uh, for a novel, graphic novel, or children's book, for example, it's going to look at your overall plot, at your characters, whether they're believable, believable whether they make sense, uh, at the pacing uh, of your storytelling as well. And all these developmental things are need that are needed to make sure that people really uh, enter your story and are gripped by it. And for nonfiction, it's going to look at the structure of your book, whether there's some kind of narrative. And even if it's nonfiction, you need some kind of narrative to, to get the people to keep turning the pages. Then there's copy editing. And yeah, copy editing focuses on the grammar, uh, on the punctuation, fact checking, and making sure that you have some consistency throughout the book in terms of tone and style of writing. And finally, as I mentioned, there's proofreading. And an important thing to remember is that proofreading should be done on your final files. So uh, when your manuscript is designed, typeset, is ready to be sent to uh, Blur or uh, other distributors, that's when you should get a proofread on it. Because oftentimes, there are errors that are introduced uh, in a manuscript through the formatting and typesetting process. And so you want to catch those before your book is available for sale. Now, how much should you budget for editing? So I'm going to give a few figures. Um, and let you make your calculation depending on your word count and what, whether you want to hire editors and which type of editors um, so that you can plan your Kickstarter budget accordingly. Obviously, developmental editing is going to be the most expensive, and proofreading is going to be the least expensive. Because when you're a developmental editor, you need to look at the overall structure. You're also probably going to catch some grammatical um, punctuation mistakes. Uh, so there, it's a, it's a much bigger job than just doing a final check on your final files. So you can use these figures. They're, they come from over 2,000 quotes that we've seen through our marketplace, so they're fairly accurate. Now, that's it for editing. So once you have your text ready, it's time to design it. And I'm going to start with cover design because it's, it's a thorny issue. When it comes to visual books, often um, you're going to have a very 
good idea of what you want your cover to be. Uh, if you're working on a graphic novel or children's book, you're probably going to use an illustration from your illustrator. Uh, if you're working on a photo book, you're going to use one of your photographs. Uh, now, what I want you to remember is that the picture or the illustration on the cover is only one part of it. The other part, very important, is the text and where you place the text and how you design the text. So the art of typography, basically. And as you can see on these covers that have been produced by um, professional cover designers, the text plays a very important role in how it's displayed as well. And um, very often, the, the mistake I see uh, by on visual books is a great image on the cover, really strong, and then very, very poor typography and, and typesetting. Um, you don't want to hire a cover designer. Um, at least get the opinion of one. We get we run monthly cover critiques on Reedsy where we get cover designers to give feedback on like 20 authors on their covers. So it's an opportunity to take advantage of, or even just like, yeah, get get an assessment of your cover by a professional designer or by a professional author in your genre. Uh, or this would be my real recommendation, hire a designer, even just to place the text on your picture. If you really want that picture on your cover, hire a designer to place the text on it. Now, cover design, the figures um, from what we've seen range from $200 to $800. Um, so if you've got the imagery ready, then it's going to be probably more $200. Uh, if you want an actual illustration on your cover on top of placing the text and you want a uh, full hardback cover with um, cover, hardcover, uh, back cover, spine, flaps, then it's probably going to be more um, $800 or $800 and up. So that's it for cover design. Now we're going to move to the typesetting and the formatting, which means basically interior design of your book. Now you've got three options uh, when it comes to designing the interior of the book. The first one is to do everything yourself. Uh, and uh, Dan uh, from Blurb is going to tell you in a minute how you can use Blurb's tools to do that for photo books and illustrated books. If you, if you choose that option, uh, which I don't necessarily recommend, um, what I urge you to do is to really study other books in your genre. So if you're working on a photo book, then open other photo books on your coffee table and take inspiration from books that have been traditionally published and have had high production value uh, and try to replicate a little bit those designs you see there. Um, another option, which is going to be more costly, but I mean, if you're running a Kickstarter campaign, it would definitely make more sense to go for that one, is to work with a professional layout designer. Again, you can find those uh, on Reedsy for pretty much any genre. If you're going to work with a layout designer, you still need to have a very good idea of what you want your book to be. You can't just give them an open brief and say, hey, here are pictures, make a book for me. You need to give them the text, you need to give them the pictures, and a clear idea of what you're expecting from them. Now, the last option, uh, which is uh, very interesting one is to actually work with a production manager or uh, what certain people call a uh, book packager. And that's basically trusting a, uh, another, a visual book professional with all production related questions. So that's going to be cover design, interior design of your book, um, the editing as well. Production choices like paper, trim size, uh, hardback versus paperback pricing, and all these things. So for those of you who don't want to learn um, all there is to learn about visual book publishing, uh, think that there are really, really good professionals out there who come from traditional publishing companies who can actually help you with all the stages in there, uh, all the stages I've gone through. And it's not necessarily expensive. A lot of Kickstarter campaigns I see for visual books, um, they're by professional photographers who will hire a production manager, book packager, to help them create the book. And they state that in their Kickstarter campaign, and that's perfectly fine. Obviously, it's a, must, uh, it's a costlier option, but it's one where you're sure that you're going to end up with as professional a result as you can. And it's obviously going to be a lot less time intensive on your side. Now, whatever option you go for, um, think about what your book is going to look like in the end and all the all the ways it's going to be consumed. So make sure that there's a visual consistency throughout the whole book uh, and that it's going to look great on e-devices, that it's going to look great as a paperback or as a hardback if you're going for that. Think about 
when you're thinking about the cover, think about the uh, back cover as well, think about the spine, and make sure that the interior design also matches uh, the exterior uh, design of the cover. So if you're going for working with designers, make it be a good idea to hire the same designer to do the book cover and the interior design to ensure that visual consistency throughout the book, sort of then. So now on to marketing. That's what a lot of people uh, have sent me questions about prior to the webinar. How do you market a book? That's a million dollar question. Um, well, the first answer to that question is to really work on a pre-publication marketing plan. So know exactly what you're going to do after you hit the publish button uh, on Blurb and send your book to other retailers. Now, the first question you need to answer in a, in a marketing plan is who your target audience is. And hopefully, if you run a Kickstarter campaign, you've already answered that question, because um, it's one you need to answer as soon as you start planning that Kickstarter campaign. Um, now, in terms of target market, I'm not thinking here demographics. I don't want you to say, OK, it's like um, females in the ages of 20 to 50 years old um, who speak English. It's not a target market. You need. Uh, interests, you need comparable titles. So you maybe if you're working on a photo book, um, that's also a travel book about Myanmar, think people who would buy The Lonely Planet for, for, for Myanmar, typically. Uh, that's a target market. Use a comparable title, and um, you don't necessarily use demographics. But that's a good start. Then how are you going to reach it, to reach that target market? That can be any means, whether it's through local bookshops, if your book is on a, on a local subject, or if it's through Facebook advertising, if it's a global audience defined by an interest, for example, Myanmar, there's a grid. You can definitely target people who are interested in uh, traveling to Myanmar in the next few years uh, on Facebook. Oh, and um, it can be as well PR uh, through specialized blogs. If your book is on a, on a, on a subject that has lots of blogs about it, can be anything, but you need to know how you're going to reach that target market. Then, because you've done a Kickstarter campaign, you need to think how you're going to leverage your Kickstarter backers. As I'm saying, as I was saying, Kickstarter not, is not just about the funds; it's also about getting people who are passionate about your product. So you can ask them for a little bit more um, than just the funds. Once they've received the reward, the book, you can ask them maybe to leave you a review on Amazon to help you boost your rankings or ask them to tell their friends about it. Like, You've built a street, street team of people who funded your project, who are passionate about your project. Use them without asking too much of them, of course. And finally, the last question is more a long-term one. If you really build, want to build a book-making uh, career, is how can you capture your readers? If you're going to, uh, sorry about that, if you're going to um, publish other books, uh, you want to make sure that the people who buy your first book, you can reach out to them when you're publishing the second book. And usually, that's done through your website and your mailing list. People buy your first book, they read it, they like it, and you have a link at the end of, their, of your book um, that points them to, their, to your website. Hopefully, they visit your website there. They can sign up to your mailing list. And once you have their, mail, their email address, you can basically email them every time you're publishing a new book. Or if you have a blog, when you have blog posts, or you can keep in touch with them. But I see too many authors um, publishing a really, really great book and getting maybe thousands of sales on that book. So it's a success. So then they want to publish a second book. And they assume that these thousands of people who have bought their first book are going to buy their second book. But if you don't have their email address or a way to let them know that the second book's coming out, Amazon's not going to tell them uh, that it's coming out. Like They're not going to know automatically. So make sure that you have a way of capturing those readers. And finally, this last slide is more for you um, to be aware of all the ways you can market a book. Uh, so on the left-hand side, it's more like platform building. If you're going to produce several books and you want to increase your mailing list size and your traffic on your author website, and the right-hand side uh, covers all the things you need to think about every time you're going to publish, all the things that are going to go into your uh, marketing plan. And at the bottom, you've got a list of ideas for marketing a book that I've seen a lot of authors um, use effectively. So that's using ARCs, which are advanced review copies, which you send to your street team. That's basically what you do through uh, through, through Kickstarter. 
you produce a book and then you send kind of uh, the these pre-publication, your book's not awfully officially published yet, but you send those early copies to your uh, to your best packers. And then they're going to be able to help you spread the word um, when publication uh, time comes. Uh, crowdfunding is there. Um, Facebook ads work really, really well for books. Amazon ads as well, by the way. Uh, running promotions, if you qualify for BookBub, obviously uh, go for it. Or there are other book promotion sites where if you discount your book for, like, say, five days, um, you can buy an ad on their site or to their uh, mailing list, and they'll advertise your discount to their list. Uh, running giveaways as well to build your mailing list is really effective. And then obviously PR, blog tours, uh, and social media. So these are all ways you can use to spread the word about your book. Now, I don't want you to be doing all of these. I don't want you to be doing to think about who your target market is and then define two, three ways in which you're going to try to reach it. If it doesn't work out, then you can try other ways. But don't be trying too many things at once, because otherwise, you're not going to really be doing each of those um, effectively. Typically, I hear a lot of authors telling me Facebook ads don't work, and it's just because they're doing them wrong. So if you're going to try one of those things, make sure you learn about it first, uh, or maybe hire a book marketer who specializes in that. We've got lots of book marketers on Reads as well. Um, but don't dismiss a marketing channel just because you've tested it improperly. So that's it for the publication process. And now I'm going to leave you with uh, Dan. It's going to tell you everything about printing and distribution on Blurb. All right. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Readsy and Kickstarter and also the, other, the rest of the team here at Blurb for putting this all together. And also thank you for all of you people out there all over the world. It's pretty exciting to see those names coming in from all these different countries. Excited that you're here, and also excited that there's a lot of first-time bookmakers out there. I remember way back in the day when I made my first book and how excited I was to get it, and uh, I'm still excited to get them after all these years. But there's one thing I want to say before I start the presentation, and that is uh, that bookmaking is supposed to be fun. Over the over the past six or seven years working with Blurb, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of photographers in particular, put a lot of pressure on themselves to make the perfect book the first time out. And I think that's a lot to ask. And as adults, regardless of where you live in the world, we have a million things on our plate that aren't necessarily the most pleasant things to pleasant things to do. So bookmaking should not be on that list. If you're stressed out or freaked out or you're having problems, just walk away from your computer and come back to it because it'll make the process a lot more fun. Okay, so the questions that came in uh, preliminary before this began were sort of all, they, they covered a pretty wide range of, uh, of questions. We had people asking about prepping files for books all the way through how to get in the bookstore, which is almost impossible to cover in 15 minutes. But I'm going to give you a treetop level sort of look at Blurb and how it works and some tips about getting your books in stores, distribution, et cetera. The first slide is uh, formatting your book. And there's four things I want to talk about. So when it comes to making your book, there are four pieces of software that I want to talk about. The first one is called BookWrite. And BookWrite is the free downloadable software that you can get at blurb.com. It's cross-platform. It's a great piece of software. Even if you have design chops, I think it's worth uh, taking some time and, and investigating BookWrite. It allows you to do books, eBooks, magazines, trade books, all from the same piece of software, and it's pretty good. So if you don't have a book that requires a lot of design work, then BookWrite is a great place to start. I use it all the time. The second uh, piece of software is Adobe Lightroom. And when I teach uh, photography classes or I give uh, workshops, I always ask people how many people use Lightroom. And I would say 75, 80% of the audience typically uses Lightroom. And if you know, inside of Lightroom, there is a book module. And the book module leads directly to Blurb. Uh, I like this tool. I use it more than I used to in the past. I would describe it as more of a streamlined bookmaking tool. If you need a catalog or a portfolio, it's a great piece of software. If you need something that has a lot of design to it, it may not be the best place to start. But if you're already in Lightroom doing your photography, this is a great place to make a book. OK, the third piece of software is the Adobe InDesign plugin. And for those of you who don't know, Adobe InDesign is the industry standard design software. Every designer I know uses it. It's a beautiful program. I don't have a design background. I was always a little intimidated by InDesign. But Blurb came out with a plugin, which you can find at Blurb.com. It's free. You download it. It automatically installs in Adobe InDesign. And it basically allows the program, you tell the program exactly what you want, and it fabricates your documents for you, the cover document and the body document, almost instantaneously. 
this was magic to me. It really opened up this program for me. And if you've never used InDesign and you have access to this software, it is definitely something to download and work with because InDesign is a blast. It's like looking at a blank canvas. There are no limits. The last thing I want to talk about is PDF Uploader. And PDF Uploader is if you already have a PDF file that you want to get printed, you can go to blurb.com to the PDF Uploader tab and you can upload your book and have it printed. It's really slick. Uh, this is not something I use a lot because I'm using the InDesign plugin. However, the people that I've spoken to that have used the PDF uploader at Blurb have said it's maybe the best one out there. So not to brag or anything, but uh, definitely worth checking out. Okay, so that's a little about formatting your book. Uh, Ricardo, if I can move on to the next slide, which will be, yes, production decision. So you've chosen your software. Now we're moving on to the actual item itself. And there's three or four things here we got to talk about in terms of making decisions that you have to make up front. The first is the format. And what I mean by format is at Blurb, we have photo books, trade books, magazines, and eBooks. Photo books, hardcover, archival paper, beautiful, big production books. These are, these are awesome. If you're a photographer, that's what you probably have your sights on. Trade books are global standardized sizes that come with different materials. They're also uh, less expensive than a photo book. And if you don't know what the trade books are, go to blurb.com and read about them because these are really strategic tools. I'm gonna to talk more about them in a minute. I use them all the time. Magazines, I was excited to see a lot of the people uh, uh, chatting in early about how many people wanna make ma magazines. This is a format and also ebook. Uh, and based, my, my piece of advice about formats is to really think about multiples. So back in the day, you had to always decide what to make and you had to make one thing. Well, today we don't live under those same rules. So oftentimes I will do a project and I'll do a photo book of that project for a certain audience. And then I'll do a trade book of that same project for a different audience with different materials at a different price point. That's the smartest way to look at formats. Next on the list is trim size. And trim size means once you've chosen your format, let's say you're going to do a photo book, then you choose what actual size. Do you want to do a seven by seven or a 12 by 12 or an eight by 10, 11 by 13, whatever size. Now remember multiples again, there's no reason why you can't do a 12 by 12 and then do a seven by seven. And in fact, the blurb software has a little button built in that allows you to, to design a book in one size, click a button and it reformulates that same book in another size. I use it all the time. It actually works, believe it or not. It's a miracle. It does. It's a great tool. Next up would be paper type. And I wish I could tell you what paper to print on. I get a lot of people, a lot of questions, a lot of emails and texts from people. Hey, I'm doing this project. What paper do I use? Paper is a very subjective thing. That's the, that's the difficult part. The good news is that Blurb makes a lot of different kinds of paper from really affordable, inexpensive, sort of low-fi low type, type of papers in the trade books up to archival professional Mohawk papers in our, in our photography books. And... Uh, my favorite paper is one of the Mohawk papers, and my second favorite paper is one of the least expensive. So just because a paper doesn't cost a lot or it doesn't look like it was originally intended for photography doesn't mean you can't use it. So paper takes a little bit of experimentation. Again, I wish I could tell you what to use, but uh, just do some testing, and I think that's the best place to get started. And the last thing on the production decisions is about custom books. Now, this is like one of the world's best-kept secrets for some reason. A lot of people don't know that Blurb does custom books. And when I say custom, I mean things like foil stamping, debossing, embossing, placeholder ribbons, printed end sheets. And oftentimes when I'm at an event and I've got one of these custom books, I'll have photographers or designers come up and they'll look at it and so they'll hold it up and say, wow, I really wish Blurb would make books like this. Well, the truth is we do. There are a lot of different possibilities out there. And again, you can find this on Blurb.com. But just know that it's out there because these books, uh, a great book with a couple of customizations to it can really put it over the top. Uh, okay, next slide is printing options. This is pretty, pretty basic, but it, it, uh, it, there's a little twist here at the end I want to add in. So when you use a platform like Blurb, you've got two basic options when it comes to printing your book. You can do POD or print on demand, which means one book at a time. Now, before we go any further... This has only been a reality for creatives for about 10 years, the ability to make a single copy of a book. But I see people already kind of taking it for granted, like, oh, yeah, I can make a single copy. No big deal. But just think about how strategic that is. I can actually make a book, a, a, an entire book for a specific person. So imagine if you're a photographer or you're going after a specific publisher or you're going after a specific backer for your Kickstarter platform you can actually craft a book for an individual. That is an unbelievably strategic thing. The only 
offside or only sort of, uh, you know, issue that you're ever going to have with a POD book is because you're making them one at a time, your cost per unit is higher. So this brings me to the second option, which is offset. Now, some people call offset traditional. It's a four color press typically, which is how books have been printed for a long, long time. Offset means that instead of printing one book at a time, you determine what kind of volume you're going to need and you print all of the books at the same time up front. Now, you do have all of these books that you have to deal with, but the great thing is because you printed them all at the same time and you printed them in volume, your cost per unit has shrunk dramatically. Literally the same book printed POD will be up here and the same book printed offset, the cost per unit will be a fraction. And the higher you go up on the volume, the lower the price point. So this is a really interesting thing to, to, to work with. Again, some people don't know that Blurb does offset, but we've been doing it for three or four years. Now, here's the twist. Here's the Milner twist on this whole thing. Think about doing both. Let's say that you have a following and you've got 500 people that have said to you, look, if you ever do a book, I will buy it. And you're blogging and you're on social and people have written in and maybe you've even created a mailing list, a pre-sale email list, and you've got 500 people on it. Well, that gives you a pretty good indicator of how many books, if you were gonna do an offset run, why not start with 500? And then let's say, okay, well, you had you printed the 500 offset run, but there were five or six or 10 people that you really wanted to make a special presentation to or you wanted th them to be interested in the book. You could do a POD version of the same book in the same size. So that way you're utilizing both methods. I've seen this done before. It's really slick. And again, I think when you look at, at, at uh, doing books today, you sort of have to reprogram your brain to the new world order in terms of what's possible because there really aren't many limitations anymore. The limitations are typically on our imagination more than anything else. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these rather quickly. Distribution, the first one on the list is the Blurb bookstore. Anytime you upload a book to Blurb, you've got the option of selling it or keeping it private and it's on your author page. And from that author page, it's like command central. You control every aspect of that book. There's no listing fees, there's no charges here. If, you, if the book costs you 10 bucks to produce and you sell it for 20, you're gonna get the 10. It's just, this is the method that I use to sell my books. It works really well, I blog and I send people directly there. The second option is Amazon. And if I had a dollar for everyone that came up to me over the last 10 years and said, can I sell my blur book on Amazon? I'd be, I wouldn't be rich, but I'd be, you know, I'd be doing okay. The, the answer is yes. You can sell your blur books, your blur photography books through Amazon. And it's a pretty, pretty simple. It's a one click setup. And Amazon, as we all know, is a global, it's, it's the, the biggest machine in the world at the moment. It's a global audience for you. So that, that's doable. The next one is Ingram. Ingram is an enormous book distributor worldwide. And if you make a trade book with Blurb, you can also list your trade book to get it into physical stores through Ingram. Physical stores like Barnes and Noble, as we all know, which here in the US is, uh, is, is, the, is the, the monster remaining out there in terms of brick and mortar stores. And lastly, there's another thing that a lot of people don't know that Blurb offers, which is warehousing. So let's go back to the, to the volume printing for a second. Let's say that you printed a thousand copies of your, of your cookbook and you have nowhere to put those. You're like me, you live in a small house and you've got no place for them. Blurb offers a warehousing service that allows Blurb to handle the storage and the processing of the orders and the delivery of those books, which is pretty slick because boy, I've had a lot of emails over the years from people saying, the, the, sh the uh, shipping company just literally dropped a pallet of books on my front lawn. What do I do with them? So that's not optimal. The warehousing thing could be really strategic for you. Again, you can learn a little bit more about it at blurb.com. Again, just to recap, I use the Blurb bookstore a lot. I love it. It works really well. Um, but you've also got the Amazon option and the Ingram option. So a lot of choices here. All right. I think we're on to the last slide. All right, how to get your books in stores. Now, we could, we could spend a month talking about this one particular subject. This is, a, this is a tricky scenario, but I'm gonna try to give you as many pointers as I can. So the first one on the list is choose the right bookshop. So luckily for all of us that are on this webinar, there are so many bookstores now that focus on illustrated books, art, photography, design, et cetera. So if you're doing a book on art, photography, design, et cetera, you wanna find the bookstores that are gonna sell the kind of work that it is you're doing. So I've seen plenty of people take photo books into stores that sell literature and the, and, the, and the bookstores are like, what am I supposed to do with this? So you want to make sure you're choosing the right places first and foremost. And within most major cities, there are a handful of bookstores that will cater towards what it is you're trying to sell. The second bullet point is show consistency. And so if, you, if I walk into a bookseller, a book retailer, and they've never met me and they don't know me, and I have my very first book in my hand, 
it's difficult for them to judge whether or not, even if your book is fantastic, whether or not that book was a fluke or if this is something that you've done over time. So imagine walking into the same retailer with three books, one you've already done, and you could say, this is the book I already did, and it sold X amount of copies, and then you could present them with the book that you want them to buy currently, and then you could say, and the next project I'm working on is X, Y, and Z. So that way it shows a consistency to the quality of your work and the depth of your work. Next up is create the right book. So again, over the years, I've gotten emails from people that said, okay, I created a book with Blurb and it's $100 a copy. How am I gonna sell that in a bookstore? The short answer is you aren't. There is, a, there is a, uh, an exception to that rule, which I'll get to in a second. But most of the time you have to deliver a book that makes financial sense. So instead of, it may not mean you're gonna be able to make a 12 by 12 hardcover pro line unbelievable, beautiful artifact book and take it into Barnes and Noble or a local bookstore and have them sell it. You might have to make a version of that book that's less expensive, that could be even be a different style and format. It could be a behind the scenes book about your project, not a book about the project itself. And that book might cost $8 or $10. That way the bookseller has much more wiggle room to be able to stock and sell that book. So if you're walking in there with a giant coffee table thing, it's gonna be tricky unless you have done an addition. And what I mean by that is you've done an addition of a specific quantity. Let's say that there's only 100 of those books or 200 and they're signed and numbered. Then that retailer <clears throat> has something to work with. And even though the book may cost $100, they might be able to sell it for much, much more. Again, tricky, but, but worth trying. Next up is under, understanding the system. A lot of book retailers will not accept your book unless there is a significant discount, sometimes upwards of 40%, sometimes more. So when you walk in, there's gonna, they're going to want a discount. A lot of people are unaware of that as they walk in the first time. And the second thing is book retailers are typically, if a book doesn't sell, they're looking for you to buy those books back. Um, now, non-traditional booksellers, which are other kinds of retail, let's say you're selling books in a clothing store, oftentimes they don't ask for buybacks, but they're also going to buy a fewer copies of their book. They, you, they may only buy 10 copies of your book, but if they only sell eight and they're stuck with two, they're stuck with those two. So again, each situation is a case-by-case -case scenario. Okay, the next up is work with a book packager. Book packagers are like this missing link between amazingly creative people and the publishing industry or other industries. And so a book packager are, is someone that can not only help you address specific publishers and also the retail side, but they can also look at your project and sort of steer you in a direction that they think is the most marketable. Now, just to fabricate an example here, imagine if you're a photographer and you're, you're doing sort of a monograph style book or you've done a photo essay or a travel book and you think, oh, I want to take this in and sell it, at the, sell it at the store and this book is about my photography. A packager may look at that and say, no, this isn't about your photography. This is about your trip. And they may turn that book into something like a behind the scenes book of the, of the trip instead of a book specifically about photography. That's kind of what packagers do in a nutshell. They do a lot more, but that's the crude, crude example. Okay, know your markets. Is your project regional, national, international, et cetera? So you might've done a project on say blackberries in New England and you go into a bookseller and you say, I wanna sell this across the country. Well, the bookseller may look at you and say, look, that's a regional thing. We're gonna sell that in six different stores in New England and that's it. But just know retailers do this. Even, though, even if you have a national or international chain, Oftentimes they will buy books in small quantity for regional stores, so that is an option as well. And I encourage you to look for stores that don't traditionally sell publications. It's uh, one, the novelty of being approached by someone saying, I wanna sell my books in your store. It's an educational option for you to go in and, and, and to say to a vendor, look, maybe it's a clothing store. Look, you're a, you sell this clothing, there's no, nobody else in your industry that's selling books out of a store like this. So again, think, think sort of outside the bounds of where we've been in the past. And lastly, build an audience. We could talk about this for a month as well. Building an audience is a tricky thing. It's, a, it's solving an enormous riddle. I am a huge fan of blogs, websites, and newsletters as my primary audience building tool with social media on top of that in a very thin little level. Your audience, and I'm talking about real audience. I'm not talking about people that will just like something and move on. I'm talking about people that will engage with you in conversation. And that's where the blog and the newsletter comes in. If someone opts in to receive a newsletter, they are, they are saying, yes, I want you to bother me with an email in my inbox. And they'll also, they tend to be people that are looking for a little bit more contact with the author, more experience, more conversation. And I think when you build up your newsletter email list, these are the kind of people that will buy the publications that you're putting out. In addition to using social on top of that as an announcement of these things coming into the world. 
So again, that in a nutshell is, is the blurb system. There are many, many nuances here to, to most of these topics. If you, again, if you're just starting out, uh, don't stress. Don't make it uh, a stressful experience. It should be fun. Get a second opinion from someone you trust and uh, start with the most amazing work you can possibly make, whether you're a writer or a photographer or a designer. Wait until you have the highest level of work that you produce. It will make the project much more fun and it'll give you a much better chance of having your work accepted uh, in a larger, to a larger audience.